Hi guys, we are live. Um, I think I will let the list populate for a little bit and wait for Bufetis, who should be joining us momentarily. Thank you for joining the stream, Brent. I appreciate it. Um, today we'll be talking about collecting watches. And as you know, Bufetis has very strong opinions on the subject. So in addition to sharing with us his collection, um, he's also going to be talking about the ideas he has about collecting watches, which, as I said, are very particular and strong. So I'm sure it will be an interesting conversation and possibly a controversial one. Brent, thank you. Golden, uh, welcome. It's lovely to see both of you. Obviously, I'm going to turn on the camera in a little bit. Um, I do have a backup plan as well. Worst case scenario, I will, now that I'm a little more competent with the camera, I can show my pieces and maybe talk about some future directions as well um, in terms of how I plan to expand the collection, um, incoming pieces of which I have two. Yes, I appreciate you guys being here. Right, yes. Um, I am wearing today my root beer. The sixteen seventy five three on the jingly jangly two tone Jubilee bracelet, which I love. And I have some other pieces to show right at hand here in the lovely Scatola del Tempo box. So and yeah, worst case scenario, I think we'll have a little uh, one to one, one to two session where we just talk and where some of you guys can join as well uh, in conversation or if you want to show a few pieces from your collection. Anko, thank you. Thanks for being here. And, and Golden, thank you so much for uh, dropping that message uh, in Marcelo's stream, because for sure I wasn't going to do that. Um, I talked about it before. I talked about the live stream that we are going to do with Bufatis before, but I wasn't going to just drop in and drop a link, which I think would be a little inappropriate. But yeah, since Uncle Junga came, I can you know, show my root beer again. Um, and in fact, why not take it off for a second and have a more proper and 
yeah the dial i think doesn't quite show its true colors so to speak on the camera it's really a great sight in person and again just to have an idea about how these vintage bracelets age and slacken in time. It's, um, you gotta have the appreciation for it. It's not for everyone, but that's why we love them. And that's why we have the contemporary models as well. Um, <clears throat> Clint Eastwood's reference, I don't exactly know, but let's let's pull it. I think his might have been the four-digit reference. This is the transitional model that still has the nipple dial, but it is a five-digit reference. The easiest way to tell, I hope we will have a clear picture, is... Um, the four-digit reference has the applied crown. So that's very distinct. Um, and if we have clear pictures, and I think there are a few nice shots of, of Clint Eastwood's two-tone root beer in film. So we might be able to see Yes, I found the picture I had in mind. Yeah, I I was right. So it's, I mean, it's the Clint Eastwood, if you want to call any two-tone um, root beer with, with the matching two-tone Jubilee bracelet, um, a Clint Eastwood. But as you see, once I zoom in, even if the picture is not crystal clear, you can have a sense of how that crown is applied. And that's a four digit reference. I'm assuming it's either from mid uh, or late 70s. And of course, um, unlike mine, it has the bicolor bezel on, which I have right here. Which I also like to change into once every so often. And if Diego was here, he could show us how quickly that can be done. Um, simply by using a few household appliances. Um, I do agree, Uncle Jung. I, I just, when I was looking for this watch, I just could not find a four digit that was, that was to my liking. You know, the, I know some people are really enamored with dials that have aged particularly and me too you know from far but for a watch that I would like to own um, I like dials that have aged gracefully let's say uh, anything that's too out there either you have to really appreciate it it has to be exactly the watch you want it's you know with the exact patina you imagine or uh, you have to be, you know, a collector worth his salt with multiple examples of certain references. And then you can have, you know, one that's, that's more conventionally uh, acceptable and, and beautiful and, and others that have aged in peculiar ways that... Um, that would be of some interest. I, as much as I like the jingly jangly 
Jubilee, um, I have these uh, leather suede and rubber straps as well as NATOs that I use with these watches on, on a more daily basis. Um, this, for example, is usually the suede strap that I've used um, for the root beer. I have a nice gold um, buckle that goes with it, that has the crown. And for me, that really dresses down the watch in a special way while still keeping um, you know, its, its style intact. And this is something that I learned from an older Italian friend that I have who was gifted um, by his parents a two-tone date chest on his graduation from high school. Um, and that was the 90s, right? So I'm sure uh, it got a lot of wear. The Jubilee became jingly jangly. Um, however, of course, as time passed by, he thought it was it was just attracting too much attention. Uh, so the solution he found was getting a nice uh, alligator strap and putting a Rolex buckle on it. Um, and he's even a little more muted because even though it is a two-tone watch, he went with the steel buckle. But that that I thought was was just a brilliant idea of still keeping things interesting while uh, having at least the option of dressing down the watch a little bit because again, two-tone watches in general and two-tone Rolexes in particular, it's uh, it's an acquired taste. It's not for everyone. It certainly would attract all sorts of attention. It might, you know, for people like us, uh, you know, like me, like Uncle Janga, like Jamie, who has a beautiful bluesy, um, it can be a nice conversation starter. Um, for others, it's it's just too flashy. And perhaps in a way that's, I won't say it's stronger, but in a way, it's it's uh, it attracts a different kind of attention than a full gold watch. Jamie, welcome. Um, I hope you have a drink in hand. Uh, but in my case, it's too early in the morning, so I can't even even justify <laughs> by my usual excuse, which is it's five p.m. somewhere. But. I hope you do have a drink in hand. Yes, Ernie, thank you so much for being here. I like the Snoopy in the avatar. Yes, and I I mean, look, Uncle, I, I, I do love I do love the uh, dials on, on all of them. As I said, even even those that have aged in unusual ways, because Again, as aesthetic objects, they are beautiful to appreciate, you know, from far in photos when you have a chance to um, play around with them and, and take a look at them. Uh, let's look at a few examples. I'm sure we can find some uh, dials that have aged in different ways on... <laughs> In 24. Beautiful. It's it's always nice to have uh, the pontiff's guidance with us when you see, for example, how this has turned all matte, and that's the raised crown that I was talking about. You see, that's very distinctive of the four-digit reference. When it comes to the transitional model, you know, from around um, 81, 82 to 84, 85, <clears throat> the nipple dial is preserved, but um, you don't have the applied crown anymore.
And yeah, that's the kind of aging I, I like, for example. Um, it's very muted, almost a burgundy color, at least in these pictures. Um, and I'm glad this, this example came across uh, with an oyster bracelet, with a two-tone oyster bracelet. And I know the opinion is somewhat divided when it comes to other JMTs. Some people like the Pepsi on the Jubilee, uh, the Marathon Man special, so to speak. Um, and I do like it too, but I can't deny that somehow these Pepsis and Cokes and even the ones with the black bezel have somehow imprinted uh, themselves on our minds with the oyster bracelet. Pardon me. Um, so, you know, objectively speaking, uh, in terms of how the watch became iconized, so to speak, um, it's hard to deny that it somehow belongs on the oyster bracelet. And, and as much as I sometimes prefer it on the Jubilee, that's how I even imagine the watch to me to be, uh, when I say GMT master, uh, I prefer the Coke bezel, but the picture on my mind has a Pepsi bezel and has an oyster bracelet. When it comes to this model, the root beer, it's the opposite. Um, I almost always imagine it on a two tone, um, Jubilee bracelet. I, I just think that somehow expresses the quirky character of the watch much better. Um, and of course it distinguishes it from, from other pieces in the lineup, which was, I think, part of the intention that these were often placed on two-tone Jubilee bracelets. Um, watch Nicholas, welcome. I'm, um, I'm very, very happy to see you here. Uh, let's see if we can find an example of of a dial that has aged a little more unconventionally. Um, I'm, I'm even afraid to look at the prices at this point. I am wearing this watch today um, as part of this conversation because this was the watch that I got with my own money. The first watch that I uh, bought with my hard earned money. Um, here's a full gold example with a gold Jubilee bracelet, hidden clasp. And, and you don't even want to know how much these go for at this point. I think it's a little overpriced as, um, as, uh, Chrono 24 usually tends to be. Um, but still, I don't think you can find a decent example for less than 35k at this point when it comes to the full gold model. Um, and when it comes to the two tone, uh, believe you me, the, these are nowhere the prices that um, that I have paid for it. And th that's the funny thing, you know, at that time, no one really cared uh, for the root beer uh, because even among the two tone watches um, in the Rolex lineup, even uh, against the Bumblebee, so to speak, the, the two tone GMT master with the black dial, it was undesirable. Uh, and it was much cheaper. I did, I did love it the minute I saw it, but I can't deny that um, part of its attraction to me was that it was within my budget and, and easily um, among all these other Rolexes that I wanted to acquire to expand my collection. Which, you know, again, I must say at that time, it wasn't really a collection because I only had 
the watch I inherited from my father, which was a submariner. See, Uncle Jonga, this is one, uh, this is a five digit, just like mine. Again, the transitional model that still had the nipple dial rather than the one with uh, matching gold surrounds. Um, but this has aged in a way that's almost smoky, right? You have darker patches of brown and, and some lighter tobacco colored patches of brown. And again, I have, I have nothing against it. It looks beautiful. But for, for my first uh, purchase in the vintage market, I shied away from that. Um, if I could afford to buy another one now, I might imagine myself getting something that has you know, a dial that has another kind of visual interest for sure. But I, I'm coming back to my first point and somewhat repeating myself. Um, but yeah, I think, you know, of course, a two-tone watch can be one and done. And and I know I know a few people uh, for whom a bluesies is, is, is a one and done watch. And I think that's that's beautiful. That's beautiful. Um, Plastic was yesterday talking about how he was, he held a public service job and he was basically fired for wearing a bluesy uh, to work as it incited some, some jealousy. Um, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt it. Uh, I wouldn't doubt it. Because as I said, in, in certain ways it attracts a certain kind of attention you know a full gold watch uh, especially on a leather strap if it's a sleek uh, profile that leans more toward the dress watch genre maybe it's it's a lot more discreet than a rolex that you actually wear on on a two-tone bracelet you know, it's 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 really hard to miss, uh, for better and worse. Um, I'll I'll just continue, uh, you know, showing off uh, my other pieces, which, as it stands, are all Rolex. Um, and this is a watch that we are all quite familiar with. It's the Bipolar Explorer, the Archie Luxury Edition. Um, I have been, well, at the time, I had been eyeing a more modern uh, Rolex watch with a GMT function. I really love this one because, once again, it was the orphan child of the lineup, so to speak, uh, among modern uh, Rolexes especially. Um, not many of the sports Rolex watches came with a white dial at the time. Of course, there are always exceptions when you talk about Rolex, um, when you talk about all these years of production and numbers and special requests and everything. But within the established lineup, um, this was a watch that that really stood out. And, and for a long time, it was... It was for the, again, it was negative attention, right? It was left out in a way. Um, there are examples of the polar dial uh, or polar version, let's say, that have always been desired. Um, there's a cream dial, of course, that uh, that commands and has always commanded um, a much higher price tag than than the usual white. Um, the earlier five-digit reference, which is sixteen fifty-five O rather than sixteen fifty-seven O, those still have the white gold, the 
matching white gold surrounds. Whereas, uh, as you know, the modernized 16570 has the blacked out aesthetic that I think contrasts beautifully with the white dial uh, and I think plays well with that brushed steel bezel with the sunburst uh, finish. Um, yeah, I think, you know, I, I already uh, was eyeing this among other models, but I started watching Archie around 2015. Um, and this was one of the one of the models, one of the watches that he was always flogging. Um, of course, there was the Omega uh, Speedmaster. An Omega Speedmaster, man on the moon. And um, and there was basically the the Pollard, right? You know, those were the signature watches. Of course, of course, we love the Pontiff for his for his Pateks and and for his world time, for his annual calendar, which is a very special uh, Patek complication. Um, of course, there was that particular moment in time when he was just uh, wearing his gold sub, uh, telling people to fuck off and get out of his way, uh, which is really the kind of spirit and, and energy we desire from the pontiff but yes as uncle Janga says uh he has always been an advocate of steel stunners uh investing in steel sports models so i thought why not why not this is uh this is a watch that i want this is a watch i would like to wear and it's also again very nicely in my budget and i i haggled i haggled so hard and it was actually in a jeweler uh who was trying to get rid of his watches um he just thought that they weren't worth the trouble that there were too many people coming in and out um you know haggling with him like i did uh, he was just getting impatient with the whole thing. And I got it down to the price I want. Um, and then he pulled out the box and papers. And I was I was very positively surprised because I wasn't expecting uh, to get them. Um, so I was very happy. Uh, and the other thing that I like about this watch is, is that even though it's a modern uh rolex it still has the holes case um which to me again is one of the great functionalities of of a vintage rolex um because you can just use one of these to pop out the bracelet and pop in you know pop back in the lock pins and strap through a NATO or, um, you know, use a leather strap, which, which I think can, can play beautifully. I, I like actually when I do get, take off the bracelet, um, I like using this strap with, with the polar. It does a very nice texture white contrast stitching and again the steel Rolex buckle that I think distinguishes it really nicely uh, that also goes well with the sub by the way the the gray uh, with the way that a sub ages of course so this is really a sweet spot for me uh, around 99 2000 uh, the solid end links are introduced. So the bracelet, even if it is not as robust as the contemporary models, still has a very modern feel, uh, still wears uh, very nicely. Um, and I think as a, 
as a daily driver. This is just perfect. And yes, instead of the, uh, this is among the watches that I will be showing you today without the first two editions. My only uh, Luminova watch. Uh, so this is the only one that still actually uh, glows in the dark and that still charges. But I do, what I do like about the earlier Luminova rather than Super at least against this style it might just be a just be an optical illusion but it contrasts really nicely it has in certain moments this sort of cream um shade which does remind me of the of the earlier versions um you can find of course these five digit uh polars polar explorer twos um with the tritium dial, which I think is very beautiful. Um, and some of them have aged into this um, eggshell kind of uh, color that the Italians call rice grain. Um, there must be a few examples on Chrono 24, which we can take a quick look. at chrono fucking 24. Um, yeah, also, you know, one of the things I like about the bracelet from around this time is that it has a folding clasp. So again, for daily wear, uh, you know, it won't pop out. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's a great, great watch to wear on a daily basis. Um, I'm not planning to retire any of my watches, at least not just yet. But if that day comes, um, I'm sure this is the watch that's going to get even more wear. Um, Ernie, I can imagine you wearing that under the California sun. That, that's, uh, you know, you can or can't, you know, you may not wear any watch. I think being out there in the sun is... Uh, it's just a great, great feeling. Um, yeah, especially if you if you suffer like a lot of us do from a kind of seasonal uh, depression. Being out there when the weather is good, um, it's hard to deny its invigorating effects. And finally, right at the moment the lockdown started. Um, I just decided to get a watch that that I always wanted to get. And I wanted to have something that's slightly more compact, um, that's very pared down in design. Um, and, you know, that would be more of a dress watch rather than a sports watch. But wait a second, I had promised you to take a look at Chrono 24 uh, for some examples of the five-digit polar. Um, let's not skip out on that because that tritium dial, when the loom plots age, uh, is is really really nice and. Again, the way it ages against the black dial is a more familiar aesthetic, right? Look, for example, at this black dial 16570 uh, that is being sold out of Japan. This is a very familiar aesthetic with Rolex watches. Um, in the way that the aged tritium uh, loom contrasts against the black dial. Uh, it might be just a slight aging with an eggshell kind of shade. It can be um, like these, 
which is a little more creamy. Um, you know, with older examples from 50s, 60s, sometimes it ages into this um, almost orangish uh, pumpkin like shade as well. But this is probably the most common um, aging of tritium that you would see. And, and I think it's, it's really beautiful. I do like that aesthetic. But again, speaking of how uh, the polar is really set apart in a way in the lineup um, is how you see that contrast uh, between the white dial and and the aged tritium loom. I mean, look at this, for example. Again, it might not be everyone's cup of tea, but I think this is this is just beautiful, and and you don't see many Rolexes like that. Look, this is even more sleek, um, and this is. This is from the time that we still had the white gold surrounds. The hands uh, are, I think, are, are changed. Uh, I don't want to speak too quickly. You know, it's very hard to pass judgment on any watch from such distance just by looking at photos. It's not even fair, but... If we go back to our initial point of interest, it's it's just a very, very interesting contrast there with the white dial against the creamy loom plots. And I just want to show, before we move on, I do want to show you the green dial. Just so you have at least a visual anchor. And this is um, the earlier five digit reference, right? 16550. It has the original papers. And you see how uh, distinctly different it is from the white dial as well. But the way that the hands and, and the, especially the second hand, the GMT hand, and the indices have aged, I think, again, creates a very subtle uh, beautiful contrast with the dial. And you can see also in the earlier reference that the font of the numbers on the bezel is slightly different as well, a little boxier, I want to say, a little more, um, you know, brutally modernist, so to speak. Um, yeah, I, th I think it is it is very underrated. It is gaining in appreciation. So it's it's just about the right time to get to get one for yourself. Especially if you can find an example with with box and papers. I know Diego has a full set, for example. Um, just jump on it, jump on it. The black dial is still um, I think that that's, that's the steel, that's the steel, um, that's the piece to get while you can, um, and you can put, put your heart at rest. You know, you won't, you certainly won't lose money on that. Um, you know, pending a global crisis of, of some sort, but you certainly won't be losing out on anything, you'll wear it, you'll enjoy it. 
um, especially with the solid end links. It's a, it's a beautiful modern watch that you can use on a daily basis. But if you ever want to get rid of it, trust me, uh, you won't be losing your shirt, especially if you can find an example um, under 8, 8.5. Don't miss it. Uh, the polar is trending a little higher than that. Um, and I, I would still I would still get it. And again, you know, I, I did say box and papers. But when it comes to a watch like this, if it's going to be your only watch or if it's going to be your daily driver, who cares about box and papers? Trust me, if you find a good example that's intact, uh, whose lugs are not polished down to a toothpick, um, where the bezel uh, has not completely fade, uh, faded out, that's one thing you need to look out for. Um, mine, as you probably, you may have noticed, it had um, started fading on a couple of points. I, I don't care because um, I wear it very often. You see at 3 o'clock and at 9 o'clock, you can kind of see how it started fading. Um, if I were buying new, I would I would probably try to get get one with with a bezel that's uh, that's not faded out because you can certainly come across examples that have completely faded out, uh, especially if they're from early '90s. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's um, it really doesn't doesn't matter if you're going to wear it on a daily basis, um, and of course. The replacement bezels, um, even if they are not as common for those um, for GMT Masters, can still be found and can still be found at decent, reasonable prices. So it's not it's not the end of the world if if that's the only thing that you don't particularly like about the example that you came across now. Um, I was talking about a watch that I got right at the start of the lockdown. Um, and since I had three Rolex sports watches, um, and I wanted something still uh, within the same larger aesthetic, you know, something with an oyster case, obviously, um, but something that is a little more discreet, a little more subtle, something that tends towards the dress watch genre more than anything. And and I was able to find uh, this particular date just, um, which you can see has the silver linen dial. It's a five-digit date just from the 70s, 16014 with the white gold bezel, which contrasts beautifully. I do like the ones that have the engine turned bezel as well, which is a slightly different aesthetic and, and gives me a more, it gives me a sportier vibe. Um, I wouldn't mind having one of those at some point in time. But I feel this this also just is a very subtle and nice uh, dress watch. Um, of course, it's smaller at 36 millimeter, whereas most vintage Rolexes are more along the 39. It doesn't wear too small, as you see. And yeah, I think I like the all silver aesthetic of the watch. I don't mind having a date, honestly, um, which wasn't something I, I began with, which wasn't something that I used to. 
um, and which wasn't something I took for granted, as you will see with my first and last watch here. Um, but yeah, I don't, I don't mind this a three hander with a date. Um, the Jubilee bracelet is great, and it's it's less jingly jangly than uh, my two tone here, which really rattles like a snake. Um, but yes, it's uh, and it has, of course, the plain clasp that has the danger of coming off if your wrist expands really. So I, I don't uh, always enjoy that, but the way it wears, the way the Jubilee bracelet wears is of course very comfortable, very airy. And uh, when it comes to the dial again, I think it gives almost an integrated aesthetic to the watch, uh, all silver with the raised crown there, or applied crown, I should say. Um, and you have the tritium dots behind the indices that have also aged to this um, orangish color, if you can see. The one you can probably make out the best is right under the Cyclops next to six. Um, yeah, I think date chests are, are actually, you know, if you're focusing on Rolex mainly, uh, thank you, Deacon. Thank you. If you're focusing on on Rolex mainly, I think I feel like it's it's a shame not to have a date chest in your in your collection. Um, as a as a dress watch, it can fill a particular gap in in any collection. I think uh, it can be still a great starter watch. The four-digit date chests are really hard to find in good condition. But these sorts of early 70s uh, five digits are still quite intact. You can find great examples. Um, and it's probably one of the most affordable vintage models that you can get your hands on. So it can be also a great starter watch for someone who doesn't mind or, in fact, prefers a smaller case size. Um, it's beautiful on the Jubilee bracelet. If you find it uh, with a bracelet that's mostly intact, um, you know, again, unlike my root beer, um, it's, it's great. You can wear it on that. And I think, once again, um, I think like a gray strap on that, Right. If you want to make it a little sportier, um, a dark brown or or even a black alligator strap, I think it can make it a beautiful dress watch. You can preserve the bracelet that way, or, or maybe you just prefer to wear your dress watch on a leather strap, which again is pretty easy to work out with the holes case. And yeah, when it comes to buying them again, I would I would privilege condition above anything. You know, make sure that there's no um, humidity or water damage on the dial, which is, of course, an alarm bell for all sorts of um, 
problems that you might experience. Um, you know, make sure that if it if it is a model that came with the loom, that all the plots are intact. Uh, in some examples, they have fallen off. And, you know, that not only would they be missing, but when tritium falls off on the dial, usually it, it ends up creating some sort of damage and wear on its own. Um, the bracelet, if you're going to wear it with the bracelet, um, you know, try to get one that's, that's still um, tight. A lot of good watchmakers do specialize in, um, in restoring these vintage Rolex bracelets, oysters and jubilees. Um, I know our friend Alex at Perpetual Time does a great job as well. There's a place in, in Hong Kong that I, that I sent um, one of my bracelets to that I would recommend. Um, but I, I trust Alex. So next time I need a bracelet restoration, I don't think I would think twice. I would just send it to Perpetual Time uh, in Liverpool. Um, I think that brings me to my last and first um, luxury uh, and vintage wristwatch. And I think this will also express in a way my views on, on collecting watches. I think, of course, um, it should all hang together. Of course, when you have multiple pieces, um, it's great to fit them into a theme. It's wonderful if there's a connecting thread that runs through the collection. Um, it's, it's even better if you have in mind certain occasions to wear them, if you can cycle through them, if you can rotate them in some way, uh, show them all some love, uh, give them wear uh, and make memories with them. That's all good, but I think at the heart of each watch collection, there has to be one watch that can be your one and done, that can be your only watch, and that you would be happy with if it were your only watch, right? And, and this, to me, is the watch uh, that could be my only watch if I ever uh, had to liquidate my collection, get rid of all my pieces. Um, I could, I could live the rest of my life with just, just this watch. Um, this is a watch that I inherited from my father. It is a four digit sub. And I, I just like, again, in a, in a similar but different way to the day chest that I just showed you, I just like the pared down minimalist aesthetic of this watch. It's a two liner, right? Unlike the 1512, 1513 is a two liner because it was not chronometer certified at the time. So it doesn't have those two lines that uh, describe that on the dial. Of course, it has, it doesn't have a date function. Um, and that just makes it one of the design wonders, really, of, of watchmaking, if you ask me, because um, it's just simply beautiful. You see how the hands and the dial have aged more or less in a uniform manner. The minute hand has a little bit of, of a spot right there, uh, which to me is not a problem at all. Um, one of the issues that you sometimes come across with 
the vintage Submariners is is the Loom Pearl, of course, that's on the bezel. Sometimes they have fallen off. I don't even mind that. I'm happy to still have mine. But I think, again, uh, with a vintage watch, you know, who, who really... Who really cares? I think they are, they're beautiful. Um, and again, one of the things that I like about vintage Submariners is of course that the fact that the bezel is, is bi-directional and turns smoothly. Um, without any clicks, I actually love that. Um, for the kind of timing that I use it for, uh, that doesn't really matter um, because I usually use it for cooking. I use it for the parking meter. Um, if I didn't actually have my uh, washer and dryer here, uh, I might have used it for the laundromat to know when it's finished. It's finished. Um, but yeah, in this case, uh, it's not like I would be in a life-threatening situation if I somehow knocked that bezel against something and it ended up um, being set off from the time that I wanted to use it for. It's really, really beautiful. Um, Decon, thank you. I would, I would never, um, I have never bought a watch from a Rolex AD. I've never used Rolex for, for servicing my vintage watches. I don't think the time will come that I will do that. Um, but yeah, never say never, but it's not something that I instinctually do you can see it has the original rivet bracelet, which I think is a beautiful detail that distinguishes these vintage submariners or vintage oyster bracelets, I should say. Uh, you will see that it has some of one of these uh, so-called tropic uh, dome crystals. Uh, I acquired at some point this super dome that they used for the sea dwellers. So next time I send this to my, to my watchmaker, I think I will have him install the super dome because I really like that uh, aesthetic. It's like, it's like wearing a little uh, UFO on your wrist it's it's very nice and again you know of course the rolex submariner is is a classic in the sports watch genre um it's one of the first divers watches but i think a two-liner uh especially from this period where the profile is is slimmer uh the case is smaller um can actually be a beautiful tuxedo watch, right? Not only because James Bond wore it that way, but again, because it's it has a very simple dial, just three hands, uh, just two lines of writing uh, beyond the Rolex branding. And you put it on a, I don't have a black uh, strap right now, but you put it on a, uh, you know, nice leather strap, I think you can hardly get any better. And the black dial, I think, in a black tie event, um, even though it might not be the most traditionally accepted choice, really fits with the aesthetic. So, yeah, if I ever, God forbid, but if I ever had to liquidate the rest of my collection, uh, I would be happy to just live with this watch. 
Uh, yes, yes, I do. Again, uh, floodland. Um, it's to me, it's very common to wear wear these on straps. In fact, I had the sub on on this um, vintage uh, tropic rubber strap, but I dressed it up um, for this particular live show. Um, I love the fact that some of the vintage ones have the curved ends, so they fit really, really nicely um, with the oyster case. And that brings out the real uh, sporty element of the watch. And yes, it was, um, speaking of James Bond, uh, I remember seeing, uh, at least in one scene of Dr. No, where um, Sean Connery was wearing his Submariner on a leather strap. And that, that always intrigued me. And I chose a strap that had some interlining you know so rather than the dress watch aesthetic i wanted to get a strap that's that's more in line with with the submariner as a sports watch because not all leather straps are equal of course you know you can have very fine uh, and thin leather straps that really bring out the dressier and more elegant side of your watch. And you can have straps like this that are filled a little more, right? Lined with some extra material inside that I think fit really well, actually, if you wanna wear a Rolex sports watch on a leather strap. Um, and yes, the, the buckles are always a nice touch, but it's not a must, of course. Ernie, um, if you would allow me to to be vulnerable for a second uh, without really breaking down, um, that would have been great to have such a classic Rolex piece gifted down from your father is priceless. Um, my father actually passed away when I was three, so I didn't really have that experience where he himself gifted me his watch and trusted me with his timekeeper. Um, it was my mother who gave the watch to me uh, when I graduated from high school. And I think it's still a priceless experience, of course, but what you're describing um, would be just amazing. And quite honestly, thinking of, you know, one day maybe potentially liquidating the collection. Um, yeah, I, I would I would rather have my father, honestly. <laughs> Let me put it that way. It's it's beautiful. Since I have lost him, it's beautiful to have his watch. Um, if I did not lose him. I think, yeah, I would rather have it on his wrist and have him alive. And, you know, we could do other things together and he could keep his watch. I'll try to uh, afford some four or five digits on my own. Um, yeah, I'm not I'm not planning to sell. I actually just added two pieces, one of which has arrived and is still sitting in the box. Uh, and the other is on its way. Uh, actually, um, it, it, I think it will come in next week, uh, I hope. Um, and I would love to do some reveals. Um, 
I'm going to save it for another stream. Um, I'm not planning to get rid of any of my watches at all. But you never know. You know, you, you never know how life turns out. Um, but for now, my attitude towards it is really um, over my dead body. <laughs> right? I wouldn't change it uh, for the world. Um, it's uh, They're all beautiful to me and they all have their special place um honestly i i love those that i got for myself as much uh on some level as much as i love the one that was passed down to me um and yeah i wouldn't i wouldn't really change it for for another collection i know in certain moments you know i see I see certain vintage watches and I say like, you know, would I just liquidate my entire collection and, and just take that? Um, like just yesterday when we were looking at some examples of, of the seat dweller, of vintage seat dwellers with um, particularly the, the ones that are called double, double red, right? They have the seat dweller and some mariner in red. That's that just checks so many, so many different boxes um, when it comes to a desirable vintage model. It's a beautiful sports watch. Um, you know, some of the examples at least have that super dome. Uh, so it's it's heftier on your wrist. It's it's it has more presence. Um, and who wouldn't want the watch like that? But I think at least at this moment in life, I have having, I, I like having different options. Um, I like having more than one watch. Um, yeah, Ernie says, I have the sub, never thought of the black straps, really looks great. I think so. I think on, you know, depending on how your watch looks, you know, if it's more modern, I think with a uh, glossy um, black alligator strap, it would um, it would really make it somehow straddle that boundary between a dress watch and a sports watch, especially if it's a no date. Um, there are some matte black alligator straps I think if you are uh, still more exclusively dedicated to the sports genre, and if you think of the Submariner as a sports watch exclusively, which you have every right to, of course, uh, that's what it was made for. A black uh, matte alligator strap would fit beautifully. I think a dark brown is a nice touch, uh, and, and mine is a dark brown, but you know, one of the beautiful things about leather straps is they take on patina so well and they get darker in time. Um, so that's always an option. A gray leather strap, again, it's a, it's a beautiful option. And I haven't showed the sub with that, I, I don't think. That also um, looks pretty sweet. Um, Yeah. Right, the way it's aged. The gray looks pretty sweet as well. Um, I'm trying to remember where I bought uh, this gray strap from because I really do like it. Analog shift, yes. Um, they deal in watches as well, but they have these beautiful, um, I think Italian made leather straps that I really appreciate. Um, and once every so often they have this deal where you get two and the third one is for free. Uh, again, not sponsored by them, <clears throat> not affiliated with them in any way, but when you have a good product, when you benefit from it, um, 
I really appreciate it. All right, uh, we are right over an hour now. Um, I'll share the link if, if someone wants to come on the stream and um, chat a little bit. Um, you know, if you have any ideas about vintage watches, about um, collecting watches, if you want to learn a little more about any of the watches that I showed today as part of my collection, um, you know, it would be really nice. If not, we will see um, each other on Marcelo's stream quite soon. And of course, on the Pontiff stream later in the day. Later in the day for us, of course, here in the US and especially uh, here on the West Coast. Um, otherwise, uh, again, guys, um, Honestly, I mostly think of this as a personal journal that I make public. So I don't really expect much of anything at this point. But since I'm also interested in reviewing some of these um, coffee table books, um, which do a lot of times have a hefty price tag, uh, I would love it if, if this could be self-sustaining a little bit at least until it becomes monetized. So um, a small thing you can do for me is to like this video if you have actually enjoyed it. Um, subscribe to the channel um, if you enjoy the content, if you're looking forward to uh, some of my future presentations. I like, uh, I like to uh, share this uh, red book of Rolex, which is a very nice general reference uh, book. It also has great photography as well. Um, like, for example, some, some examples of the Oyster Perpetual here. Um, of course, the Paul Newman Daytona is a must. Um, Some. Anyway, um, I I would love to do a more proper presentation about the man and his watch, where I'm not sweating bullets and and making a fool of myself in camera. Now that I'm a little more comfortable and I have a better sense of the angle, um, I want to actually present on. Uh, Nick Folks's um, Nick Folks's um, reverser book. Oh, my friend, PSK. Uh, PSK is a fellow boxing guy and and just a general. Yeah, lovely, lovely guy. Great gentleman. Uh, really selfless. Um, a hard worker. A, a real Rolex man, really. I, I never knew that he did have one, um, but it doesn't surprise me. Uh, PSK is exactly the kind of guy that I would uh, imagine wearing a beautiful day chest. Got it for my 30th birthday a few years back. Um, yeah, as I was saying, um, I, I would love to present on, on Nick Fox's reverser book, um, I want to present on this new uh, Louis Vuitton book called The Birth of Modern Luxury, which can be an interesting conversation um, because of the contrast between the heritage of the brand and how it's perceived today. Um, I think it could be interesting. All of these are uh, future possibilities. I'm always open to uh, your suggestions for future content. But as I was saying, um, since uh, we are just taking things off the ground and uh, the, a lot of these books cost a pretty penny, I would appreciate if 
you think it's appropriate um, that you, uh, you know, use my cash app to make perhaps a small donation. Um, and if someone is feeling extra generous, I will also uh, reveal the new one, the new watch that I bought and that's already with me um, and still sitting in, in its box. Um, and my address for the cash app is of course, dollar sign L H B V B. So if you do, that's great. It helps me uh, expand the channel. It helps me get to that level where I can um, monetize the channel. Uh, if not, I already appreciate that you were here. You were interacting. Um, I appreciate that you uh, listened to me uh, rant, um, pontificate, and also share some memories. I appreciate your interactions in the chat. Um, and I will see you in the next one. Again, please like, subscribe, and tell your fuckhead circle jerking friends. Uh, salute to the pontiff. Um, we're all his children at some level. Um, and yes, if you're feeling particularly generous, just uh, how do we do this? Yes. Take a look at this address. And I really appreciate all of you. I will see you in the next one and on Marcelo's stream. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone.